this video will serve as your uh, morning review session for equilibrium and reaction rates. So we'll run through all the learning targets just like normal. So first off, I can use the collision theory to explain how different factors affect the rate of a reaction. Uh, remember, in order for a reaction to happen, um, collision theory is the idea that particles have to hit with enough energy. So they have to hit with the activation energy so they can get over that hump. Uh, and they have to hit with the correct orientation so that bonds are able to be broken and new bonds are able to be made. Okay, so collision theory is about energy and uh, orientation. And so the things that affect it are the things that affect the energy or the orientation. So size of particle, if I have greater surface area or smaller particles, essentially I can increase interaction, thus allowing for potentially more um, orientations. So speed up the rate. Uh, a catalyst essentially lowers the amount of energy necessary in order to uh, make a reaction happen, right? It lowers the activation energy. So therefore more particles are able to react and it's faster. Um, if I have more heat or energy in general, that just means I'll have more particles able to overcome that energy barrier. And then concentration and pressure, um, if I have more particles or they're packed in a smaller area, they're gonna hit more often which means uh, statistically they'll hit uh, more often with the correct orientation. Okay. Uh, number two, I can understand what activation energy is and how it relates to reaction rate. So both these graphs here show you activation energy. That's that hump. Essentially, it's the energy from start to peak if you're going forward or from start to peak if you're going in reverse. So it's the amount of energy necessary to uh, make the reaction happen. Okay. It's essentially a barrier for all reactions uh, because that energy is higher than the energy difference between reactant and product. So whether it's an exothermic reaction like the first one or an endothermic reaction like the second one, you always have this like peak or this large barrier that you need to get over. So for the first graph, that activation energy is labeled Ea, which is what activation energy usually is shorthanded. And in the second one, the amount of activation energy is T plus U. It's all the way up, okay? It would just be U in reverse, but it's T and U going forward, okay? Next one, I can under explain, sorry, how catalysts affect a reaction. So a catalyst, again, decreases the activation energy. Essentially, it gives a new pathway for the reaction to occur. Uh, so most commonly, it's shown just with a decreased um, height or hump for the reaction pathway. So if this is my reaction pathway, it's endothermic, and this right here is my um, necessary activation energy, what a catalyst will do is it won't change the start and it won't change the end, but it'll decrease the amount of energy needed, right? So now I only need that amount of energy to get from a reactant to product. Next one, I can interpret graphical information regarding equilibrium. Uh, so the concentration graphs you see on here, with concentration, what you'll see is um, when it reaches equilibrium, the concentrations won't be equal, right? Concentrations aren't equal at equilibrium, but they will be constant. So once I've hit equilibrium, nothing's changing anymore. Color's constant, temp's constant, pressure's constant, concentration's constant, because even though reactants are becoming product and products are becoming reactant, nothing's happening on the macroscopic to actually shift or change uh, the amounts of stuff. Okay? So both of these concentration graphs, um, even though in one the uh, amount of reactants and products cross, they achieve equilibrium once they're um, constant. If you had a rate graph on the other hand, which is that teeny tiny graph on the bottom, uh, rates will be equal at equilibrium. So they actually will come together and travel on um, horizontal as the reaction continues. So rates are constant at equilibrium. Next one I can predict if a reaction is product or reactant favored from graphical or numeric information. So graphical information is up here. Um, essentially, uh, whatever is favored is whatever you have more of. So the graphs are probably the easiest because like in that first graph where at equilibrium I have more products, that means I'm product favored. And in the second graph, because at equilibrium I have more reactants, that means I'm reactant favored. So favored just means at equilibrium you have more of it, meaning like you shifted in that direction more. Um, so graphs are really easy. If on the other hand you had numeric information, that's based on K then. 
So K is always product over reactant. So if K is greater than one, that means I'm product favored because that uh, numerator will be bigger. And if K is less than one, I'm reactant favored because the denominator will be bigger. So favored really means just was ever bigger. So if you have more product, it's product favored, more reactant, it's reactant favored. K greater than one, product favored. K less than one, reactant favored. Okay, let me get a little bit more into the mathy stuff. So I know how to write an equilibrium expression, and also I can calculate things. So an equilibrium expression is always K EQ equals. And it's always products over reactants raised to a power of their coefficient. And it's only aqueous things and gaseous things. Um, solids and liquids are not included. Okay, so if I look at the product side on this reaction that I'm giving you, um, Mn2 plus is aqueous. So, oops, so that's part of my KEQ, and that's in brackets. Sorry about that. No coefficients, nothing raised to a power. Water's a liquid, so I'm not going to include it. And then chlorine's a gas, so I will include it, but it does not have a power. Now, going on to the reactant side, I have that H3O plus, which is the hydronium ion, and I'll raise that to a fourth. Uh, then I have the Cl minus ion, and I'll raise that to the two or square it. And then MnO2 is a solid, so I won't include that. So that is what an equilibrium expression looks like, uh, just no solids or liquids included as part of the expression. You'll also have math as part of the test, and that's what this next problem looks like. So I give you the equilibrium constant. Um, realize that I say that it's this at 500K, that's the temp. 500K is not the equilibrium constant, right? That is a temperature in Kelvin. So the equilibrium constant is 1.67 times 10 to the fourth for this problem. I ask the concentration of NO2 and then I give you a whole bunch of information. So step one for all your math problems will be to write a K because you need it in order to solve the problem. So in this particular problem, it's always going to be products over reactants. So my product is NO2, and that's going to get squared. And then my reactant is NO, and that will get squared. And then O2. So that's the equation I'm actually going to plug into. Now I can start plugging in. So the K value I give you is 1.67 times 10 to the fourth. Uh, what I don't know is that NO2. That's my thing I'm solving for. That's the question. What's the concentration of NO2? And then for the bottom part, I need concentration. And don't forget concentration is moles per liter. So I get that I have 0 0.0620 moles, but that's in 1.5 liters to make a concentration. And that's NO2, so I have to square it. And then O2 is 0 0.0832. And again, that's in 1.5 liters, and there's no power on that. So that's the math I would have to solve for this in order to get the concentration of NO2. And if I rearrange that and solve, I get an answer of 1.3 three molarity. This question also asks me to do just mole. Um, and to get mole, if you remember, big M is moles per liter. So if I want moles and I know I have 1.5 liters, I would just multiply those two to get that. And if I multiply those two, I get 1.9 mole. So those are your two answers. That's the only math that's on this particular test, is just manipulating this equilibrium expression. And so the only hard part here is no solids or liquids and make sure you're in molarity when you're solving. Le Chatelier is a large portion of your test, very large, uh, probably too much, but I love it. Um, so again, stress is something you do externally. The shift is a response to your stress, and Le Chatelier says it will always shift to try to undo what you've done. And then you can talk about what happens to the concentrations because of that, okay? So let's start with an easier one. Let's start down here with the concentrations. They usually help people more, okay? So if I increase the concentration of B, right? So B is a reactant, it's on the reactant side. If I increase B, that doesn't mean I will have more green. It just means I'm stressing the system by adding more B. Okay. Then the reaction is going to shift to try to get all the concentrations back in line with the value of K. 
Okay, so the chat is that says it's always going to shift to undo what I've done. So if the stress is I've added B, the shift is I want to take away B. So if I uh, increase the concentration of B, the shift will be towards the products to make B go down. Uh, as a result, A will go down because it's on the same side of the arrow as B, and C will go up because that's the direction I'm shifting towards, and the reaction will become more pink. So one phrase I've heard before is up away. So if you increase something, you're always gonna shift away from it to make it go down. Okay, so if I decreased B on the other hand, that would be my stress. Again, Lachat Lier says I'm gonna shift to try to undo that, so I'm gonna shift towards putting it back. So if I decrease something, I always shift towards it, which means in this case, A would go up because it's on the same side as B, and D would go down, thus making it more green because A is going up. Right, so that's concentration. Uh, temperature, I often think of temperature just as another factor, like um, a substance, just because it's written as part of the reaction. So in this particular one, if I raised heat, because heat is on the reactant side, I would have to shift away from an increase to make it go down. So if I increase heat, I'm gonna shift to the right, thus making it more pink. If I decrease temp, I'm gonna shift towards the heat, thus making it more green. Pressure only affects gases, and it only affects gases uh, when I have an unequal amount. So if you look at this particular reaction with A, B, C, and D, I have two moles of substance on the reactant side, one A and one B, and I have four moles on the product side, three C and one D. So they have an unequal amount. So if I increase pressure on the system, the system is gonna wanna shift to relieve some of that pressure. And the way it relieves pressure is by shifting to less stuff. If I have less stuff available, it'll be less things hitting and thus a decrease in the pressure in the system. So for this particular one, if I increase pressure, I'm gonna shift to the side with less stuff. So that means I'm gonna shift to favor reactants and make it green. If I decrease pressure, on the other hand, I'm going to shift to put more things in, so I'll shift product and it'll become pink. Okay. So that's Le Chatelier. If you're having trouble with that still, do some of the review questions on Le Chatelier. The last thing with Le Chatelier is graph reading, and you will have to be able to do this. I reviewed this in the other Le Chatelier video also, but essentially with Le Chatelier, you can see one of two things on your graphs. If you see a beautiful spike, like you see in that first graph, that means that is the stress. What happened at that spike? I added I2. Some external factor came in and sh shot that guy up, okay? So if I asked you, what is the stress in that first graph? The stress was I increased I2. Because of that, I shifted right, the product went up and the reactant went down. For the second graph, because you don't see a spike, that means, um, you have to kind of make more assumptions about what the potential um, stress was. Now, for this particular graph, I don't have Cl2 there. So because of that, if I look at the graph, I see I2 is going up and ICL is going down. So the stress could have been that I removed Cl2. Okay, I don't see that spike on here. It's not graphed, but that could have happened. That could have resulted in this. Uh, another possibility would be things with temp. So most commonly when you see these general slopey things, we think temp or pressure, okay? Again, when I look at this, I can see that it shifted to favor the reactant side. And the way I could do that with temperature is by increasing temp. If I increased temp, I would have shifted away from it, thus favoring the I2 side. For this particular reaction, pressure would not have affected it because even though there are lots of gases, uh, both sides have the same number of two moles, so no side is favored in terms of decreasing and increasing pressure. That's it for your review session. Uh, be ready for the test.